Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, the show where we dig deep into the insights of some of the leading policymakers and business people in the Middle East and indeed the world. I'm Frank Kane. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Sir Tim Clark, President of Emirates, the biggest airline in the region and one of the key players in the global aviation industry. Sir Tim, welcome to Frankly Speaking. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Good morning, Frank, and it's great to be here. Let me jump straight into it. It's been a torrid time for the airline business, hasn't it? And especially for Emirates, which built its reputation and its business on the notion of global connectivity. The COVID era put an abrupt stop to that last year, didn't it? And we're only just recovering. Give me a snapshot from your expert point of view of where we are on the recovery path. Well, I, I, I guess it's anybody's guess as to what's likely to happen over the next year. If you had asked me a year ago what the situation was likely to be in the summer of 21, I would have said, and I was quite confident, that the vaccine rollout would have taken place and that there would be a return to growth and a re-establishment of the airline's uh, networks in the summer of this year. Now, clearly that hasn't happened for the reasons that uh, we all know. Um, but despite the multiple restrictions that certainly Emirates faces and most of the other foreign carriers in the world, other carriers in the world who have international networks, they are all pretty hamstrung by the conditionality of entry into many countries. So taking the short term view, I think we've got another six months of uh, difficulty. Uh, if you ask me what I think about the summer of 2022, I think it will be completely different. I still think there will be problems with the the uh, rollout of vaccines in the developing world, which needs to be attended to by the developed world, if we're going to get, get things back to normal. But um, I think people have uh, ha, 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 are ready and willing to start moving and traveling again in all sectors, whether it be corporate or uh, leisure or all the other things. So I'm fairly confident that uh, next year we'll see a completely different picture. Uh, and that certainly airlines will emirate, uh, like Emirates will have restored themselves to um, full capacity, albeit possibly six months later than we had originally thought. OK. Uh, do you think uh, Emirates and Dubai uh, have been too quick to call the peak of the pandemic? Uh, last December, when Dubai opened up big time for foreign tourists again, you said you thought we were over the worst then. Uh, but clearly not. It's an unpredictable situation, isn't it? But frankly speaking, with hindsight, was that call premature? No, I don't think so at all. Uh, uh, I think Dubai has handled the, the, the pandemic and the effects on, on, this, uh, on this country, and in this, this case particularly the Emirates of Dubai, uh, very well. They were, they were first movers, remember. They were first movers in establishing lockdown in April and May last year. They were early movers in the acceptance that vaccines are going to sort the problem out eventually. Absolutely right. They have the, the highest inoculation rate in the world, I would say, beyond, uh, exceeding what the Israelis are doing. They are currently testing over up to 300,000 tests a day, PCR tests a day. The rate of positivity in that is 0.6%. So there aren't many countries in the world that embraced or understood and recognized the difficulties of what this was going to do and acted very, very quickly, well ahead of the Western counterparts. So it's not surprising that in the summer of last year, when the presence of the virus in the UAE was in, in measured in terms of infection rates, was almost down to zero, that the government, certainly in Dubai, took the opinion, took the decision, in my view, rightly, to open the uh, economy, and that was done on July the 7th of last year, and uh, continued to, to, um, to expand. Uh, and of course, Emirates was right behind it. Now, of course, we weren't to know that the virus would mutate to the level it, it has done. And don't forget, some these mutations did not take place in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, one took place, the first one was the Kent virus in the United Kingdom. Uh, latterly, there haven't been other viruses, and we've now got the situation where we have a, what is called the Delta variant, uh, originally uh, 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 an Indian source, theoretically. We don't know. But the fact is, that's what we're, where we are. So did they make the, the right decision? Yes, they did. Uh, the airline adapted fairly quickly, as it has done to the downturn as a result of new variants coming out. But uh, again, the, 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 the town, the city will adapt. It's, it's known for its adaptability. It's known for its response to market, and it's known for its ability to adapt effectively 
and uh, both in the short, medium and long term. So I, I don't think that's, uh, uh, if you can call it that, a criticism. On the contrary, I think on the basis of the evidence that they had, um, that the decision was the right one. All good points. Uh, but in terms of the Emirates business, do you think that the pandemic has revealed some basic flaws in the business model? The idea of global connectivity around a Dubai hub, never-ending growth in passenger numbers, premium offerings to business and first-class passengers. Uh, 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 has all this gone out the window now? On the contrary, Craig, what you just said sounds really good. Are you suggesting that people won't travel? that they won't want to uh, do all the things that they did prior to the pandemic? Are you suggesting that, as many do, that you and I talking on these uh, uh, video conferencing platforms is going to kill the need to travel on business? Are people not going to travel for holidays, for leisure, for visiting friends and relatives, for the multiplicity, multiplicity of reasons that people travel across the planet? It was started in the 80s, in the 90s. And all we did in Emirates was to cobble together a business plan, a business model, which recognized the aspirations of the traveling public of the planet. And the more we did, the more we scaled, the more they responded. It was clear to me, certainly, that this model would work in perpetuity, notwithstanding the, the bumps in the road. And we've had many of those, many of those. This is probably the worst. But you know something? They all end. And we all get over it and get on with our lives. And economies will pick up and people will travel. And in many respects, because of video conferencing, people will travel more. That's the paradox. Time will tell. So is our business model good fit for, for purpose in the future? Of course it is. In, the other, in many respects, I believe that with intelligent use of the assets and the growth of our network, and the cities on our network and the, the tools that we have, both now and coming in the future, we will be a lot stronger than we have been uh, prior, to, prior to the pandemic. So, I, you know, I'm the optimist I expect. You know, people will know that. But my instinct and many of the judgments I've made in the, in, in the years that I've been here have been on the basis of my instinct of what I think is likely to happen in the global economy, in various sections, sectors of the global economy, by for reasons of the geopolitics, socioeconomics, uh, etc. And you know, we've generally got it right, and I don't see why that should change. Dubai will retain and reassert itself as a global super hub. It'll strengthen that. The airport will strengthen, uh, and uh, we will have more cities on the network within the next three to five years. Uh, uh, so just watch the space. OK, that's a confident response. Thank you very much. In perpetuity. Uh, but the global recovery has been uneven, hasn't it? And new variants are further complicating the picture. Uh, which destinations give you confidence, cause for optimism for the rest of 21? Which ones will open up and give you a lift? Well, I think uh, the United States is, is the, the first board of call on that uh, uh, particular question, and that's already very much an open uh, economy. They seem to have, uh, at the moment, uh, managed to crack the problem. So they are very open. I see the European markets in fits and starts um, gradually opening. I think the fact that they are accepting that uh, the double vaccination with uh, vaccines that they have approved will unlock a lot of the uh, access, access uh, conditionality. Um, so I think as we as we work through uh, Europe and North America, uh, I think we'll probably find that others will follow fairly quickly. So it's like the domino theory. Uh, it's in nobody's interest to continue this. Now, I say that because of a number of reasons. One, the vaccine rollout. Two, the uh, ability of the uh, national health systems in all countries. Uh, it's not just about vaccines. It's, it's about the viral therapeutics that are able to treat and deal with the, uh, the, the virus uh, if people are infected and proceed, get to the stage where they have to get into a hospital. There's a lot of things that changed since this time last year, and a lot of things will change by this time next year in the way we go about accepting the fact that one, this thing is gonna be here, probably use my words, in perpetuity, but our ability to deal with that and the way the science is advancing at pace, uh, I'm confident that it will be 
something we live with but manage and won't have the effects. That will, of course, allow countries to uh, hopefully take that view and open up as quickly as possible. And that's what I see in the next six, nine, 12 months. Uh, the UK, Sir Tim, a very important market historically. Uh, when will it get its act together and allow unrestricted travel again with the UAE? Um, again, that's anybody's guess. My, uh, uh, my own view it has been expressed fairly forcefully to the, U the UK government, and I know the United Arab Emirates Foreign Ministry has been fairly assertive on this. Um, the, the, all, for all the metrics that I quoted earlier, there is no reason why the United Arab Emirates should be on the red list at all, in my view, um, particularly as we, the, the, the country is so well on top of, of the problem. Uh, equally, airlines like Emirates and Etihad, of course, have enormously uh, draconian, uh, I guess, uh, protocols in place with regard to making sure that people don't board our aeroplanes uh, with risk of uh, infection. And there are a number of ways we go about doing that. I'm, I'm hoping that with the July 19th uh, opening, uh, that is the date that the United Kingdom government has said that they're going to relax, that with that will come a relaxation of foreign travel. Um, if you ask me in all honesty, I think it'll be one of the remnants of the policy that they will be a little bit reserved about how they go about access uh, and foreign travel. I think they're still wrestling with this in the United Kingdom. They've got to accept, of course, that if, they, if they, their, their uh, citizens have been vaccinated and can go anywhere, the reciprocal has got to be in place. So they have got to be yet they have got to accept that people who can demonstrate vaccines or PCRs, whatever it is, can go into the United Kingdom unfettered with uh, or encumbered with um, quarantine requirements, which is which is killing everything. So I'm hoping that during the course of the next few months, certainly if it's not July the 19th, maybe three or four weeks later, the United Kingdom will have vaccinated most of its population. And there is clear evidence that the vaccines that they have been uh, giving to all the population have high efficacy against the Delta variant. Um, and uh, the hospitalization rates and the ICU rates are coming down, even though the infection grows in the UK, it's not having the same effects as it had this time last year. So I think with all that, the evidence will suggest that probably August, September, they will be more relaxed about uh, foreign uh, entry and travel. Okay. There are big things coming up in the Emirates in the autumn, aren't there? The Expo, uh, the delayed Expo. Uh, tell me, how important is this for, for Emirates Airline? Is this a make or break situation for you in the autumn? Well, I, it, no, it's not a, a make or break situation. It's, it's something that um, uh, is, is, has figured very strongly in our planning, as it has done for the rest of uh, Dubai and the UAE. Um, there's an enormous investment going into the, has gone into the project. Uh, it, it is a will be an exceptionally good uh, a project to visit and see. And I, to be quite honest, along the lines that I was saying, as we move away from this particular area, I think by between October and March, April of next year, uh, the expo will be one of the go to uh, sought after uh, sort of, uh, exhibitions that people want to see and want to enjoy. Um, so I think for us. Uh, although we may be seeing a tad fewer than we had thought, but I, I'm, I'm not even convinced about that. Um, I think people in this region, the center uh, especially, want to go and get out and see things. And there's nothing better than going to the Dubai Expo and, and experiencing what they have done, the amount of work, thought, uh, content that's gone into this uh, exhibition. So on the contrary, I think it could be quite a fillet for the, um, for the airline and for the economy. The uh, Saudi business that Emirates has been running for, uh, for, for many years now has been very lucrative. Uh, what, how, how is that coming back? Uh, where are we on that? Well, Saudi, uh, the business is really controlled by what the Saudi Arabian government allow us to do. And it's been extremely difficult trying to get our flights in and out of there. Um, and they've had their own reasons for uh, closing the, 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 uh, the, the, the state for, for reasons that others have done. So we're just waiting to see how 
as we get into this unlock mode, how the Saudis will respond. We know that the Saudi airlines are coming here regularly and with high frequency into Dubai. So with that, we know that uh, in the fullness of time, although they will probably restrict the numbers going in for the Hajj, that certainly by October, November, December, I think things will be fairly relaxed with regard to the points that we, we serve and they serve here. I'm sure you saw that Saudi Arabia announced that it's planning uh, a uh, international airline, a second international airline. Uh, uh, just succinctly, what advice would you give them? Well, I, I, I hope they've got um, the, I, with anything like this, you've got to have the right people in, know what they're doing. Um, uh, they, they obviously need a, a large amount of cash to get things going, which I'm sure they have in Saudi Arabia. They, they have to design a business model, which is not random. It's got to be serving the needs of what the state actually wants or not party to. Uh, there is no reason why they could not expand their aviation sector and the aviation activities, whether that meant expanding Saudi or creating a new airline altogether. Either way, it's, uh, it's, it's commensurate and converges with the thinking that's going on in Saudi Arabia is where they want Saudi to be in the next 10 years. So, you know, if they believe that an airline, uh, an additional airline, uh, perhaps operating a slightly different business model will be uh, necessary, I'm sure they'll, they'll just get on with it. Interesting advice, thank you. Uh, going back to Emirates and on the financial front, uh, the airline, the group, recently announced big losses, five and a half billion uh, for the year to end March. Can you see a time when the airline will be back in the black? Oh, um, again, you're asking the wrong guy that because uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that with the amount of work that's going on uh, and our, the, the way we're viewing the network in the future, that we will restore our profitability um, probably within the next year or two, depending on all the things I, I've said. I see no reason why that shouldn't be the case. At the moment, our attention is mainly on the cash, and we have a, a cash burn issue, which has slowed considerably from this time last year. Um, and and uh, because we, we attended so quickly to the, uh, the uh, air cargo situation, and basically have our full fleet of 777s flying now, with both passenger and cargo operations. Uh, our income is, is better than we thought it would be. So I, if we can then extrapolate that through to the activation of the 380 fleet during the course of the next year, um, I believe we, we will return to profitability probably in the next year or two. Okay, the government of Dubai has been generous and supportive, hasn't it? Uh, uh, roughly $3 billion in aid so far. Do you think you'll need more? Well, it's anybody's guess, Frank. To, you know, it much will depend on what happens over the six and nine months. The cash burn is, has slowed. We are, uh, we are not in, in a cash critical situation at the moment. Uh, we have to be very careful about what we do and how we go about our operations. But I am 100% convinced that the, the Dubai government will do what it takes uh, to ensure that uh, Emirates is financially secure. Isn't now the time to think the previously unthinkable and consider the merger uh, with Etihad that's been talked about? Wouldn't that appear to be the answer to both the airline's problems uh, and give you access to the deep pockets of Abu Dhabi? Well, I, I, again, this, this is uh, using that famous phrase well above my pay grade. Um, the, uh, the, the, the airlines are currently um, operating as best they can under the circumstances. Um, my own view is that the, the two can work closely together, not necessarily merge, that uh, Dubai with its two airlines, Emirates and Fly Dubai, and Etihad with its growth of, uh, of the low-cost uh, carriers in Abu Dhabi. I think they're, they're taking slightly different directions, but do, does that mean that they have to merge? No, I don't think so. I think we, can, we, we have a very good relationship with Etihad and where we can help each other, um, a back of house without infringing competition law and rules in other markets, we will do that. Um, I think that's probably, in my view, what the two governments of, the, of Abu Dhabi and Dubai would want, for the time being anyway. So, Tim, the, the A380, a wonderful plane, I must say, uh, it has been critical to the airline's success, uh, but now more than 100 of them uh, are, are laid up, unused, aren't they? 
uh, costing you money in uh, uh, finance charges. Uh, frankly speaking, isn't it time to phase out the A380 now? Well, the fact that we, we've just taken delivery of two and we have three more being delivered by November, no, I don't think so. Um, on the contrary, uh, the, the 380 has, has almost defined Emirates um, in the, uh, the middle of the last decade when we, we took the aeroplane, uh, we transformed the business model, we scaled the business model, and it has worked wonders for us, both in terms of brand, perception, consumer appreciation, and attracting people onto the aeroplane. In fact, it was generating most of our profits uh, prior to the, um, to the pandemic coming along. So we, we see no reason why, other than obviously long-term obsolescence in the sense that they are, are aircraft, the last aircraft delivered to us in November will be the last one out, out of Germany um, from Airbus. So in the fullness of time, of course, it will have to go. But in the meantime, we will, we will work this, this aircraft. We will spend money on it to refurbish it, to improve the products, make it even more attractive. As you know, we've already put premium economy into it. But that didn't. That uh, was not the only thing we did. We 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 revisited the uh, business class cabins, the lounge at the back, the economy cabins. We changed out the whole aircraft, and it's now even better to travel in. Hugely popular, and I'm convinced that notwithstanding my peer group airlines have decided to ditch them, that it will continue to draw uh, our consumers onto it in 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 preference to some of the other offerings from our competitor airlines. Um, and it is, of course, critical to the fact that we intend to reactivate the business model and reactivate the 157, 160 going on 200 cities that will uh, need the 380 uh, lift to be able to draw in all these uh, uh, city pairs that, that transfer across our hub and also feed Dubai. Um, so, no, I think the 380 in Emirates has a great future, albeit time constrained by virtue of the decision by Airbus to shut the program. But we have a lot of time left to make sure it works for us. Across the whole fleet, how, how do the economics of the seating plan look in the post-pandemic world? You mentioned business travel. You think that will come back. But, you know, what will be the key features of travel post-pandemic? Well, it, it's for a start, we, we, I think there is a view, and I've shared, I've had this view for over a year now, that so long as you suppress demand, and that demand uh, is, is measurable, and we know it exists, and we know that in the short term, once the pandemic is over, that there will be a tsunami of demand for people wanting to travel for all the reasons that you and I know, whether it be friends and relatives, uh, second homes, business, leisure, the multiple segments, all of which have been suppressed over the last 15 or 16 months. So there will be a resurgence of demand. What's the space? Um, after that, we will see a stabilization. But I, again, I can, I can continue to believe that the growth in the global economy will, will uptick fairly quickly once the pandemic is over and that demand for air travel will continue to grow as it did. Now, what are we talking about here? Maybe we're talking about 4 to 6% growth uh, in, in global air travel post the pandemic, preceded by an enormous surge. But after that, uh, uh, a stabilization. I, I do not share the view that the global economy, uh, is, as regards uh, travel demand, is going, to go in, is going to go backwards. No, I, I, I will not share that view. I didn't share that view in the 208, 209 financial crash when everybody said the game is over. Uh, we ripped ahead after that, and I didn't see it in all the other traumas that uh, have happened since uh, Emirates has been in existence over the last 36 years. Um, so I remain optimistic that things will come back to normal uh, as far as, unless there are other major geopolitical events uh, which will other than pandemic, which could uh, affect what we do. But looking ahead, no. I believe that uh, Dubai in itself will strengthen as a city. It will grow as a city. It'll become ex extremely attractive for inward investment, both for business and, and uh, perhaps real estate and others. Uh, they have great plans for where they want to be in the future. And of course, all this is going to help Emirates 
and Fly Dubai in this case, uh, grow their businesses. So I remain confident that the global economy will uptick fairly quickly and we'll get back to normal. On a personal note, Sir Tim, uh, you've put in three and a half decades with Emirates, haven't you? And you were planning your retirement when the pandemic struck, but you stayed on to steer the airline through the turbulence. Is there a new timeline for your departure? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, we've been, <laughs> it's, we've been talking about this for a long time, Frank, to be quite honest. I will do what I can uh, to uh, help the, the, the government, the shareholders, to ensure that things uh, are, are going in the right direction post uh, what has happened here. For all the reasons that I said, that I believe that the airline has a great future. I believe that Dubai is going to be a formidable uh, mega city in the in the in the things to come and, and, and on the planet. Um, so whether I'm here or not, there will be people here um, who are very concerned that, of course, the airline succeeds and adds value to the, the the general plan, and they will ensure that whoever takes over for me or whatever the arrangement is is the right one for the government and 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 uh, the city and for Dubai. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, it, it's kind of irrelevant whether I'm here or not. There will be a time, of course, where we'll have to go. But does that mean that things are going to stop or change? No, I've got a great bunch of, bunch of guys I work with, um, and they've been working with me for the last 20 years. So goodness me, there's uh, the shareholders got plenty of uh, opportunity to select or do what they want to do with regard to the business. So it's kind of, it's not really relevant in the, in the scheme of things, whether I'm here or not. Does, the, does your successor have to be an Emirati? Uh, that's not my call, Frank. I, I, uh, I, I leave it to the, uh, the uh, ownership to, to the shareholder to make that decision. Finally, Sir Tim, what will you do next? Uh, don't you think there are lots of opportunities in, in the world, around the world, with the global aviation industry, where your experience could be used? Maybe a struggling airline like British Airways could, could uh, use your help? Look, I, I, um, I, I, when I step out, I will be fairly selective about what I do. Um, I, I think I would like to spend more time doing things which are perhaps going to pay back, um, contribute more other than in the commercial world. Um, I have been involved in a few other things. We set up the Emirates Airline Foundation um, nearly 20 years ago now. That's been very successful. Uh, and it's, it's in the areas that I can see need help, where I think um, in terms of, you know, uh, charitable works, etc., I think there would, there would be more value added there than perhaps, you know, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it if I was asked, but I would prefer to get involved in things other than perhaps uh, the commercial world. Um, I'd like to think that I might, uh, if I pick up this advisory capacity that I've agreed with the chairman that I would stay on as an advisor to him with regard to the aviation sector and Emirates going forward. And I, but I don't want to tread on the toes of the, the managers of the business post my departure. But I'll be around. Um, but I think I would also try to look at ways where I could add value to um, entities in the sort of charitable domain which, which need help. And perhaps I could, I could do something there. We'll see. So Tim Clark... Whatever you choose to do, congratulations on a long and successful career. And many thanks for joining us on Frankly Speaking today. It's been illuminating. Thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. Nice to speak to you.